The Emperor Julian reigned for a very short time, however he looms large in the historical imagination of many modern people. I even once met someone who had bought a, an old Roman coin with Julian's name on it and wore it as a necklace. Um, a lot of people, especially people who are anti-Christian or even atheist, admire Julian. And because he has such an enduring impact and he happens to be someone who I've studied a fair amount, I decided to do a brief series of videos and two parts. The first part will be about Julian, the man and the emperor, and the second part will deal with Julian as an intellectual and as a religious figure. So without further ado, let's begin part one, Julian as a man and emperor. Julian was the last member of the Constantinian dynasty to hold power. Now, his paternal grandfather was Constantius I Chlorus, who was the last member of the Tetrarchy system that was set up by Diocletian. Um, when Diocletian and his other Western colleague retired in 305, Constantius Chlorus succeeded to become Augustus, the senior emperor, but he died prematurely. His son Constantine was actually not included in the succession system, but he decided to take power anyway. So he came to power, he slowly but surely defeated all of the other people trying to vie for power in the empire, and he united all of Rome by 324. At some point after around 312, Constantine converted to Christianity, and the majority of his relatives also converted during that period. Constantine had a half-brother named Julius Constantius, who was Julian's father. And Julius Constantius was a fairly accomplished guy and a senior official under Constantine, having held the rank of consul in 335. Um, then you have Julian's paternal, I mean maternal grandfather, who was a high-ranking Eastern official, a prefect, and he had a daughter named Basilina, Julian's mother, and she was of Greek origin and identified as Greek, which probably played a big role in why Julian always saw himself as a Greek first and a Roman second. Now as for Julian himself, he was born in about the year 331 or 332. He was one of the younger children. He had a brother who was about five to six years older named Gallus. And we'll see that Julian's childhood after about the age of five or six was actually deeply unhappy something that's been written about quite a bit by modern scholars and alluded to by Julian in his own writings. Although he died when Julian was only about five years old, Constantine had a huge influence in Julian's life. Constantine was a larger-than-life figure who, along with his predecessor Diocletian, fundamentally changed the way that Rome was ruled. And in one way he did that was, if you look at his art, you see that Constantine kind of represents himself as, if not quite a god, then certainly something more than human. Whereas a lot of earlier emperors had portrayed themselves as being sort of these soldiers or these sort of super senators who were, you know, whatever else, mortal, Constantine portrayed himself as this larger than life figure. His bust here is about 10 or 12 feet tall. Um, obviously, human heads do not come in that size. And we'll see when we look at representations of Julian that he directly rejected all of Constantine's pretensions and Constantine's vision for what a Roman emperor should look like and how a Roman emperor should comport himself. Here is the territorial extent of the Roman Empire upon the death of Constantine. Constantine had three sons that we saw earlier on the genealogy chart. And they were going to divide the empire equally and ultimately feud for it. Before Constantius II, Constantine II, and Constans could begin their contest to become the new sole emperor, um, they decided to liquidate the potential rivals within their family who were not sons of Constantine. And unfortunately for Julian, that included his father, Julius Constantius, and the vast majority of that branch of the family. Now, the only real two survivors there were Gallus, Julian's older brother, and Julian himself. I think he might have had an even younger sibling, but I don't recall what happened to that sibling or if that person even reached adulthood. Now, um, 
In the meantime, Constantius II would go on to defeat his two brothers, and he united the empire. However, by the early 350s or so, he was already in his 30s, and he had not sired any offspring, and he was under pressure to have an heir just in case something were to happen, since Constantius often led military campaigns and was obviously in danger of dying in battle, a not uncommon fate. During most of this period, Gaulus and Julian were being raised in Cappadocia, which was more or less rural Turkey, and they were raised under the guidance of a Christian bishop, as I mentioned earlier, both of their parents were Christian, and they were raised as such. Now, Gaulus would be called away, and we'll talk about his life and career in a moment, and, but Julian basically had access to a large library in Cappadocia, and he became someone who was interested in subjects like philosophy and history and rhetoric. So he ultimately wanted to become a scholar, since politics was going to be out of the question, and he devoted himself to that life. Following the elevation of Julian's brother Gaulus, he was much more free to travel about and pursue his studies, and at one point before he himself was made Caesar and thrust into service, he was actually able to study for several months at Plato's Academy. It was during this period from about 350 to 355 when he was either studying in Asia Minor or at Athens that um, Julian really developed the ideas and religious beliefs which later made him Julian the Apostate. However, that is the subject for the next video. Back to our main subject. By 350, Constantius had won out and he was looking for support, so he summoned Gaulus and made him his Caesar. Gaulus ruled out east in Antioch, and his generals were successful in putting down a Jewish revolt and in doing some other things. However, Gaulus and his wife Constantina, who was a cousin, or not a cousin, but sister of Constantius, got themselves into trouble by holding witchcraft trials against the wealthy people in Antioch and confiscating their wealth. Now, Constantius became concerned about this and also with the high-handed activities of Gaulus in general, so he tried to summon Gaulus to Italy to get him under control. And to finally lure him in, um, Constantius said that he would make Gaulus his co-Augustus and not just a Caesar, but he had to meet him in person. Gaulus, you know, was really eager to get this extra power, so he was traveling west. And on the way, he stopped in Constantinople, and when he was holding chariot races, he did things that only the Augustus was allowed to do, like personally crowning the winners. Well, that really angered Constantius, and he came to believe that he couldn't trust Gaulus because Gaulus was clearly ambitious and, if, as we've seen from his activities in the East, definitely ruthless and possibly a little unhinged and crazy. Um, the 4th century was a time with a lot of religious zealots and crazy people, and it appears that Gaulus was one of them. So, uh, Constantius had Gaulus executed in 360, and at that time, he also had Julian brought to his court because he was afraid that Julian would take his brother's death as being a threat and that he would try to take up the mantle of his brother. In 355, Julian became Caesar, which means that in my previous segment, I messed up that date. It should be 350 when Julian joined Constant Constantius and not 360. My bad. Um, so, when Julian was elevated to become Caesar, he actually went to Gaul. This time, Constantius would rule the east and send his junior colleague to the west. The east had about three-quarters of the empire's population and wealth, so that was clearly a more lucrative job and also a source of greater danger, potentially. While in Gaul, Julian inherited some of the difficulties that had brought Constantius there, namely dealing with the Rhine frontier and the activities of the Alemanni. Julian married his cousin Helena, who was the sister of Constantius. Now, Julian does not appear to have been someone who had a very strong interest in sex. While still married to Helena, he was giving an account of a mutiny, and he mentions that they were sleeping in separate rooms despite the fact that it was cold. 
So apparently he was not really all that interested in sex with his wife. And after she died in the year 360, he never remarried and apparently never had any sexual liaisons with any other women. So that is another aspect of Julian's personality. And it also is a part of this general 4th century religious austerity and specifically the um, sort of celibacy that people who were really into Neoplatonism the way that Julian was were practicing at this time. As Caesar in Gaul, Julian did hold the ultimate authority for governing and defending the Western Empire. And I imagine that Constantius figured that Julian would take a fairly passive role the way that his brother had done and let his generals do all the fighting for him. After all, Julian was already about 24 or 25 years old and had never been formally trained for military and political leadership. However, Julian decided to really dedicate himself to learning military affairs the same way that he dedicated himself to learning philosophy, and he became a pretty good soldier. I wouldn't necessarily say great, but he was definitely above average, and we see that in the course of his campaign in Gaul over that five-year period, he was definitely playing the leading role he was actively fighting in the ranks, and he was making all of the big decisions himself, and not relying very heavily at all upon his generals, at least after the first couple years. Most of the economic and political power in the Roman West at this time was in the cities along the frontier, along the Rhine River. Um, here is a reconstruction of the city of Cologne as it might have appeared in Julian's time. So Julian would be campaigning up and down the Rhine on both sides of the river for the period between about 355 and 360, and he would do so mostly with success, sometimes more success than others, but certainly never with anything like a major catastrophe. Julian's greatest battlefield victory came at Strasbourg in the year 357. He and his army, though outnumbered possibly around 30,000 to maybe 15,000, decided to square off. Julian was cautious about engaging, but his troops urged him in the battle, and many people have taken that as evidence that the Roman army of this period was less disciplined since they tended to try to influence their commander. However, that was not an uncommon thing throughout ancient warfare, so I wouldn't necessarily interpret it that way. What it did show, though, is that the Roman troops were of very high quality as they were able to defeat this much larger force, and they did so taking fairly minimal casualties, around maybe 240 so lost, versus uh, inflicting maybe around 10,000 total casualties on the enemy, including a, about 1,000 men who drown in the Rhine River as they were routed by the Romans. Um, though the battle looked lopsided, it was apparently pretty closely contested, and rather than being a battle that was won through tactical brilliance on the part of Julian, it seems to have been a battle that was won more through the skill of the soldiers. Nevertheless, Julian took great pride in that battle, and it seems to have possibly been commemorated on at least one coin at a certain point. Back east, Constantius II found himself in a difficult situation after an invasion by the Persians and the fall of the important city of Amida. He ordered about half or so of Julian's army to head east and reinforce him. Now, some of the elite units in the western army, including the Petulantes unit, um, sound like a very uh, cheerful group of guys, they decided to mutiny and put Julian in charge so that they could avoid service in the east. Well, at least that's the official story, but many scholars suspect that actually Julian was the architect of the um, basically riot, which ultimately had him proclaimed emperor in Paris. Now, um, Julian has a description of it, and in that description he claims that he was totally innocent and that he was forced to become Augustus against his will. And there's a little bit of evidence for that, as in some of his early coins, he lists both himself and Constantius II as co-Augusti. But ultimately, we do know that he hated his cousin and that he did engage in a civil war. Um, ultimately, that civil war was resolved, though, because after Julian dealt with the problems at home, 
he was marching east and marching towards Constantinople to confront his cousin when Constantius fairly suddenly just dropped dead at the age of 44. And without any heirs, uh, Constantius's troops and officials basically pledged their loyalty to Julian, and that was the end of the Civil War. Given his hatred of Constantine and Constantius II, you would think that Julian would radically break with any traditions that they adhered to. However, what we see in his coinage and a lot of his public representations is that he actually acted mostly as a Constantinian prince. Here is a you know fairly typical um, Roman coin of this period where we see Julian dragging the long-haired barbarians by their hair and a symbol of victory and bringing civilization. This was a very common sort of 4th and 5th century trope on coins, and it shows that Julian was adhering to tradition in at least this coin. And here is a much debated bull coin that Julian released. Now, a lot of people think that this bull represents the bull of Mithras and that it was part of Julian's tr uh, effort to try to return the Roman Empire to pagan worship. However, other people have interpreted the bull as being a traditional figure from Roman paganism, so the paganism of the city of Rome from before the introduction of Eastern mystery cults such as Mithraism and Christianity, and that the bull is supposed to represent um, war outside of Rome's pomerium, outside of its um, sort of God-protected um, boundaries. So either way, though, we see that Julian was beginning to experiment with different coins. However, as we'll see, his reign was not very long, and that probably accounts for why many of his coins seem fairly conformist, despite the fact that he clearly was his own man. In November of 361, Julian found himself as the sole emperor of the Roman Empire at about the age of 30 or so. And unless I'm mistaken, he was the third or fourth last Roman to rule both the East and the West by himself without a colleague. Um, now, Julian went to work immediately trying to purge the administration of disloyal people, and he especially had it out for people who had worked for Constantius II and were close to him. So he tried to purge his administration of people who were ardent Christians or who might still be loyal to the memory of Constantius and might bear him some ill will since he had, of course, rebelled against Constantius and had tried to oust Constantius from power. Constantius had lost a lot of ground in the east when he was forced to try to deal with Julian at the same time. So Julian's first order of business was to try to reclaim the lands that have been lost in the East and maybe even achieve glory in his own right by gaining new lands or restoring the borders that Trajan had set in the East. So Julian went to Antioch and decided to build up his force over the winter of 362-363. So ironically the forces who backed him for Emperor to not go East ended up going East just under Julian. Now, he was deeply despised by the people of Antioch, and if I had to guess, I would think that it has to do a lot with his brother Gaulus. Now, Gaulus had held treason trials and trials about witchcraft when he was in the city, and now he's got a younger brother who held pagan beliefs. The people of Antioch, for the most part, had become heavily Christianized, so they were distrustful and scornful of Julian's practices. Julian had a lot of open sacrifices, and he was friendly with the famous pagan rhetorician Libanius, who was a native of Antioch. And due to Julian's sort of flamboyant paganism and his use of things like his beard as an identity marker, the clean-shaven Christians of Antioch were not very receptive. Rather than really persecuting them or going after them viciously, however, Julian really tried to kind of befriend them in a way and win their respect, so he good-humoredly accepted most of the jokes at his expense, and he wrote a play about it called Mysopagan, the Beard Hater, where he talks about how the people of Antioch really didn't appreciate him. And although there is a little bit of hidden butt hurt there, at least Julian tried to be a man about it, and he tried his best to win them over. 
However, it ultimately didn't work, and the citizens of Antioch were not sad when they learned of his death. Julian's plans for the invasion of Persia were truly ambitious. It was going to be a massive pincer attack between two very large Roman armies. One army would be under one of his generals up north, who would team up with the Armenians and then march south, and the other army was under Julian himself, and it was marching directly at the Persian capital of Ctesiphon, which is, I guess, relatively close to the ancient city of Babylon or the modern city of Baghdad, if that helps to sort of contextualize it. Now, um, Julian's northern army never quite got there in time, and Julian was put in the dire straits by a lack of supply and the fact that his cavalry was inferior to that of the Persians, which made it difficult for him to really gather supplies and keep his men fed. During um, the retreat from Ctesiphon, when he was trying to find a better spot to camp his army, there was a sudden skirmish which erupted, and Julian rode into the thick of it. He, of course, was a very brave warrior and had no fear of death, and he was trying to rally his men. Unfortunately for him, he didn't take the time to put on his breastplate, and a Persian spear went right through him. He didn't die immediately, um, and it's reported that on his deathbed, he was talking about philosophy and trying to die in the way that Socrates supposedly died in Plato's Crito. However, uh, whatever the truth of his death might be, uh, Julian ultimately did die, and he left his army in a very bad situation, and his successor Jovian ultimately had to make major territorial concessions to the Persians, which were so bad that they undermined his credibility altogether, and that led to a new round of Roman civil wars. For the most part, we actually don't know much about ancient rulers. Um, we also, in general, don't know a lot of personal information about most ancient people. However, Julian is one of the few exceptions to that general rule. Fifty-five or so of Julian's letters were preserved and have been transmitted to posterity. Now, some of those letters are probably spurious, but most of them seem to be genuine. And in those, Julian discloses his thoughts and feelings. Now, a lot of his letters are really riddled with quotes and allusions to literature and mythology and other things that it's hard to really get through them, and they don't really reveal all that much. However, Julian also was classmates with two future saints in the Orthodox Church, and they had strong opinions of him, especially after he came out as being an apostate. Um, we also have an account of him from the contemporary historian Ammianus, Ammianus Marcellinus, who was an admirer of Julian, but not an uncritical one. The general portrait we get from these letters and from the accounts by people who knew him is that Julian was a very interesting man. Now, he tended to be fairly nervous um, and a little bit high-strung. He had large eyes. I believe that some of the sources say that his eyes were a little bit watery, um, a little bit oversized. He had sort of a hooked nose. He was a little bit on the short side, at least for someone of aristocratic or noble uh, royal lineage. And his statue, pictured here, is maybe five foot four or five foot five. And it's probably about what he actually looked like, and not some idealized version or some oversized thing like we see with Constantine's head. Um, that's part of Julian's personality. I wouldn't necessarily call him humble, since uh, that's not a very common or realistic trait for rulers. However, he does not seem to have suffered from megalomania. Um, Julian was someone who was very intelligent and a quick learner. He became a competent general, even if he was not a second Trajan. Um, Julian had a lot of energy. As a lawgiver, we know that um, he was very concerned with administering justice in a way that was right, even though his activism was very untraditional. 
and did not go over well with a lot of the people um, who were his fellow government uh, operatives. And we also know that he was an extremely religious man. Um, he's someone who was very dedicated to theurgy, which was sort of this mystical um, practice of religion. And he was very ardently anti-Christian and did a lot of things to try to promote the revival of traditional religion. But we'll get into more of that kind of stuff in the second video. Now, uh, my personal feelings on Julian are that he's a very fascinating guy. Um, I find it interesting that we can see his thought progress. Um, he does a pretty good job of disguising the true extent of his hatred for Constantius, and mostly actually in his writings that were meant for public consumption, takes a lot more shots at Constantine the Great. Um, in the Caesars, Julian makes Constantine the guy who is the manifestation of vice and sin because Jesus is the great enabler of such behaviors. Now, um, Constant uh, or Julian, I can see why he would be annoying to people. He tends to talk too much, and he tries to really show off his learning to an extent that could probably be very annoying. So. I mean, I can see Julian as being a pretty balanced guy and someone who would be a mixed blessing if you knew him. So that's about all I have to say about Julian the man. As a ruler, Julian was much like his namesake from Trailer Park Boys. His reach exceeded his grasp. Now Ammianus, who was a personal friend of Julian and clearly admired him greatly on many levels, would admit that Julian had some flaws, and one of those flaws is that Julian tried way too hard to um, intervene in court cases and impose his own judgment rather than relying on laws and traditions that most Romans held sacred. So that was something which got Julian into trouble with the people around him. Um, Julian was someone who had these grand had sort of a grand vision of a Roman Empire which would revert to traditional religion and it's not really clear if he would have been able to pull that off even had he lived um, he also did not need to mount the massive eastern expedition that he did mount and had he refrained from doing so or from relying on a massive pincer maneuver with a general relying heavily on Armenian support then he might not have found himself outnumbered and, you know, cut off at Ctesiphon the way he did. So as Emperor, um, overall I think Julian comes out as fairly average. Now, had he lived, had he survived even after losing the Persian campaign, his energy and dedication to excellence makes me think that he could have accomplished a great deal and gone down as one of the better Emperors. However, we can only judge him by what he actually did and what he did was kind of a mixed bag. So uh, that's my judgment. He is a fairly average emperor who had an outsized personality and impact. So until next time, when we talk about Julian's um, intellectual achievements, I am Thersites the Historian. Good night.